This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome to Student of the Word. This is Friday, the last day that we're taking up these five lessons through this week on the life and power ministry of the Holy Spirit as He gives us the new birth and also later can give us power at the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so this is taught from my CD series and DVD series called The Holy Spirit Life and Power. And so these are things that you can use. They're 40-minute lessons. You can use them for your uh, prayer groups, your uh, teaching groups, uh, your home cell groups, all the different things you might have, Sunday school classes, and you want to teach that again, this is what you can use. And so we're making these available to you. Today we're taking up on Friday, the last in this particular series on the Holy Spirit, life and power. And we're talking about different questions that people have for today about speaking with tongues and the importance of it. the difference between tongues in your personal life and tongues in the church service to be interpreted. We're taking that up today. So again, it's going to be a great blessing. So put on your seat belts. Here we go. I'll greet you again at the end of the broadcast. So just like in the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord came on prophets and teachers and, and, and kings and others like that. But when the hand of the Lord came on them, they didn't speak with tongues. They did mighty things, but the hand of the Lord was taken off. With Jesus, the hand of the Lord came on him, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit. He didn't speak with tongues, but the Holy Spirit was never taken from him until he went to the cross. So his entire life, he had it. The only one like that was David himself in the Old Testament where he prayed, Lord, take not your spirit from me. And David was the only man of the Old Testament, despite his sins, that the Spirit of God was never removed from him. So he becomes a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, again, speaking with tongues is something we have that Jesus did not have. And so you might say, well, we actually have something more than Jesus did. That's true. We did in that respect. But of course, he knew he was under that dispensation, would not be here for the transition of it, but literally brought the Old Testament right up to its changing point left. And then after he left, the changing point came. And that was the day of Pentecost. They cost. The next question is this, have tongues ceased? I want to read the verse of scripture that many fundamentalists take and say, well, see, uh, tongues is over because the Bible says tongues shall cease. Well, let's read that verse of scripture and find out what uh, Paul was talking about. There's three chapters in a row, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, that describe the Holy Spirit, his infilling, his power, and the uses of it. And then he introduces the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in chapter 12, emphasizes the walk of love, the most important thing. Chapter 12 deals with the Holy Spirit and our desire for Him, the gifts of Spirit, but that should not be our desire. Chapter 13 tells us our desire should be to operate in love. Use these as a blessing to other people, not a way to enhance ourselves or make ourselves look good or give us bragging rights. So chapter 12 leads into chapter 13, and then chapter 14 comes after that, and that talks about the greatest use of the gifts of the Spirit plus love is to operate in the local church where you can bless as many people as possible. And those three gifts that do that are tongues, interpretation of tongues in church, and prophecy. And so, but the end of chapter uh, 13, that love chapter, he deals with this. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12, here Paul says, Love never fails, but if there are prophecies, they shall fail. If there are tongues, they shall cease. If there is knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part imperfect shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we now we see into a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall even, as I am also known, I will see him clearly, just as clearly as he sees me. I'm rephrasing the last phrase there because it sounds a little dark coming from a translation, but that's what it means. He says, there's going to come a day I'll see him face to face. This verse is saying here that tongues will cease. And people just take that and lift it right up and say, see, tongues will cease. Well, let's read back over that for just a moment. He said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. He wasn't just talking about 
tongues. He was talking about all the gifts of the Spirit. There's going to come a day those will all come to an end here in this earth. And that which that is when that which is perfect is come. And people have said, and many translators have said, that word perfect is also found later on in the book of James. It's referring to the Word of God, that there's coming a time when the Word of God will be complete. So that's what this verse is referring to, they say, that when that which is perfect is come, tongues shall cease. And they say that's the Bible. Well, I come back to this. The Bible we have as a translation, we have found a few errors in it, not errors in doctrine, just errors in understanding. And that's why we have so many different translations today, which tells us the present copies of the Bible we have are not perfect. And they're always tweaking it here, tweaking it there for the different time periods we live in. Now, I agree. The Bible is the mind of Christ is perfect. There's no way we can add to it or take away from it, but there is ways we can preach on it and clear it up because why? Even though the Bible may be perfect as far as the mind of Christ, our understanding is far from that. So from what I see from this verse of scripture, we still need the gifts of the Holy Spirit because you know what? That which is perfect has no reference to the Bible. That which is perfect is the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Satan is removed from this planet at the end of the tribulation, and just as Jesus Christ comes back at the battle of Armageddon, all the armies of the earth are going to be withstanding him. The hatred toward God is going to keep increasing and increasing, and we see that happening every day. Satanic, demonic hatred covers this earth, and we need divine, sacred, we need a spectacular supernatural love in our life. And this is why we need the gifts of the Spirit. Because as we operate in love toward people, there is more today of a need of the gifts of the Spirit than I believe in all of history. We are moving so close to the coming of the tribulation and antichrist in this earth international communism is going to take over this whole world for seven years. It's going to be terrible on this earth. In fact, the second half, Jesus said, is the worst time in all history. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation. And the only one that can redeem us out of that will be Jesus Christ. And when he comes back, he will bring back that which is perfect which is a perfect kingdom, a perfect kingdom, not with presidents on the throne or kings on the throne, but Jesus Christ himself will rule the entire planet. And when he does, and he sets up his kingdom on this earth, Satan will be removed, all demons will be removed, Antichrist will be removed, the false prophet, the beast, all those will be removed, religion will be removed off the face of the earth, and all uh, religion will be removed and all sinners will be removed. At that point right there, the earth will have on it people in resurrected bodies. That's the church coming back with Jesus. And on the earth, we're going to have natural people who were saved during the tribulation. Everybody on the earth in one split second is going to be a believer. There'll be no unbelievers left on this planet. Now, during the millennium, people will be born again, uh, still need to receive Jesus because they'll be born and they'll still be born under the curse because the nature of the flesh is still here. But again at that moment. So when that which is perfect is come, the millennial kingdom, then what? Tongues will cease. We'll need no more gifts of the Spirit. We'll need no more of these things because why? Jesus Christ himself will be here and the Holy Spirit who brings in the gifts is only here to fill in for Jesus till he comes back. Jesus said that. Jesus said that I'm going away. I'm going to send you another comforter who will abide with you forever. But his actual operations will only go along until Jesus Christ comes back. So until that time, we need the gifts the Spirit, and we especially need speaking with tongues because it does so much for us. In a world filled with satanic power, we need to be accurate and close and hearing the Holy Spirit so that we will know this. So we have it here again, this verse of Scripture, and that's what it means when it says tongues shall cease. I know that in your own personal life, what you have is people that have talked to you, and perhaps in private, and they bring up these verses of Scripture, or else they just bring up what in the world is the need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's one of those things that once you receive it, you'll understand, how did I do without this? It's like, I, I know that I've got a Bible in front of me, I know that I've got a change of life, but how do I operate in God's supernatural power? Not only do we need tongues? We need all the other eight gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we also need in our own personal life that revelation of speaking with tongues to God in our daily prayer life, how important that is. So understand this, the things we're bringing out are not only applicable to the Christian world around us, but to you in your own personal life. And to have these answers inside of you, to be assured of them. It's not like you have to make up an answer when somebody says, when you walk in this stuff, you are so assured of it. Just like sharing, you know, your occupation or sharing about your love for your husband or your wife or how much you love your kids. It's such a daily thing you operate in that it's no problem at all just waxing eloquent about what God has done for you in your life. The third question I want to get into is, is speaking of tongues of the devil. 
This comes from some denominations who teach, well, you know, uh, that's got to be the devil because that, that couldn't be God that would make you speak in a language that you can understand because who speaks in a language they can't understand? Well, we do. The point of it is, is we don't need to understand it. We speak to God. The Bible tells us when we pray in tongues or speak in tongues, we speak to God and he understands it. And so basically we're speaking his language. The Bible says when we speak in tongues, we can speak in the tongues of men. That would be earthly languages, every language on the earth, or we speak in the tongues of angels. And that is heavenly language. We speak in the language that God has. So is speaking in tongues of the devil. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 11. And we're going to find out two comparisons here in this verse of scripture to God. We're going to find out he's greater than any friend we have, and he's certainly greater than Satan. And he loves us more than any friend would love us, and he certainly loves us more than Satan. And so two comparisons are brought out in this particular story or parable that Jesus is offering here. Beginning in verse 5, Jesus speaking to his disciples said, He said to them, Which of you has a friend? And you shall go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come on a journey to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And from within he shall answer and say, Do not trouble me. The door is shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him, although he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, the guy just won't quit. He just keeps knocking even after a no. It's he's, He will rise and give as much as he needs. And I say to you, I read one translation translation that really qualifies this. It doesn't say, and I say to you, it's, but I say to you. And God is setting up a contrast here in this. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Uh, knock and it shall be opened to you. Every one of you who asks, receive, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it shall be open. You know what's saying in this verse of scripture? You might have natural friends in this earth, and there's actually things that for the moment they don't want to do for you, even though you're a friend, and you are in desperate need of food, you're in desperate need of something for your children, so you go knock on your friend's door, and he's in bed and says, I don't want to get out of bed. I know, Bob, you're my friend, but you know what? Come on, give me a break. I just got into bed. I'm going to have to get up, go cut the bread for you and all this and bring it to the door. And you just keep on knocking. It says, because he is your friend and because you will not quit knocking, he will get out of bed. He may not like it, but he'll go do it. And then the contrast comes with, but... If you ask God, bam, you've got it. If you seek, you'll find it. If you knock on the door, he'll open it for you. He is so much better than any natural friend. Now here, he's not talking about Satan. He's talking about this gift is something that comes from God and he's glad to give it to you. He'll rush to the door when you ask for it. He won't tell you, come back in an hour when I've got some business to take care of. This is the God that will take care of you any time of the day or night. He never slumbers, he never sleeps and you are the apple of his eye. You are a better friend to him than any friends you have here in this earth. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say in the rest of this, in verse 11 through 13, if a son asks bread of any of you who is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, natural or carnal, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? What's he saying here? He says, if you are a son and you go to your dad, would your dad give you something that would harm you? The Holy Spirit has always been with man, but only in a limited ministry before the day of Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit lived in a temple made with hands and came on individuals at certain times to do certain tasks. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. This was not just to let us in, but to let the Holy Spirit out. From that day until this, the Holy Spirit desires to live in every person who will be born again. In Life and Power, I carefully examine the Holy Spirit's ever-present role in our daily life, the types and shadows that explain His ministry, and how the world was changed when He came like a mighty wind into the upper room, filling New Testament believers with boldness and with power. Life and Power is available in book form, as audio CDs, audio downloads, video DVDs, or as both audio and video on a flash drive. To order Life and Power, visit bobyandian.com slash lifeandpower or call 918-250-2207. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. 
You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. If you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite or call 918-250-2207. Again, the Holy Spirit never exalts himself. And listen to this, the Holy Spirit never exalts you. In uh, John chapter 16 and verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself. So we must have the right attitude about ourselves for God to give us the greatest use of the gifts in our life. The proper attitude about you is to realize I'm just a dab of dirt. I mean, the Bible says I have this treasure in an earthen vessel and my earthen vessels like anybody else. It ages and, and you know, the old expression, the sands of the hourglass flow down. Well, that's what happens. The older you get, everything starts flowing down. And uh, you just age like everybody else. You might ask for eternal beauty, but you know what? This body has not been redeemed yet. In the meantime, you're gonna keep, as you get older, you're gonna have creaking and you're gonna have stiffness and all these kind of things. You just like everybody else. And so there's nothing special about you. And if people knew and walked around with you, they might be surprised some things you say and some actions you have. We've had friends in our church that no longer want to be friends anymore because they put me on some kind of pedestal and found out one day I was human and they didn't like that. And they liked having this superstar around and I'm not a superstar, okay? Jesus is the superstar. He just happens to live in me and I work for him. And so basically I'm the roadie for the superstar. You know, that's it. Jesus, I go out and on the road and do what he asked me to do. So again, anyone who uh, speaks highly of himself cannot glorify God. John 7, 18 says, he who speaks of himself seeks his own glory. And we're not to seek our own glory. We're to seek the glory of God. Whenever anybody says says something about us, divert it to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because you know what? That's what the Holy Spirit does. You start to magnify the Holy Spirit and he'll say, no, 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 not me. I mean, there's people I know that pray to the Holy Spirit. He'd be the first one to say, don't pray to me. Pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. I just energize your prayer. I'm anxious to get it there. So don't even pray to the, oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit. He would tell you, shut up. Pray to God the Father. Pray in the name of Jesus. Even ask Jesus for some things, but don't ask me for things because I'm only here to as your connection between you and God, you and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament tells us that we came from dust and we will return to dust. Genesis chapter 3. In verse 19, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 tells us we came from the dust, we'll return to the dust. So God can take a little dab of dirt and do something with it and be excited about that, that you are even being used by God. And he even looked at you, that he even looked at you twice to think about using you, ought to just encourage you on the inside and cause you to give more glory to God himself. Other scriptures in the Old Testament say this. Abraham prayed for Lot's deliverance and God and told God of himself, he said, I am but dust and ashes. When he came to pray before God, he said, Lord, I'm coming to you as dust and ashes. That should be the attitude we have about ourselves. Now I realize you're the righteousness of God, but that's your spirit. I realize that you've got all the blessings that God has given from the throne of glory, so quit bragging about that. Look at yourself and realize, look at yourself from the outside and realize, I am so fortunate, blessed, and graced graced by God that he would choose me. And that's what Abraham said. Even coming before him in prayer, he said, Lord, listen, I'm about to approach you in prayer and I'm but dust and ashes. I'm coming to you just as I am. So again, this is in Genesis chapter 18 and verse seven. David said, what is man that you would think of him? or the son of man that you would keep an account of him. Man is like vanity. His days are as a shadow that passes away. And that's found in Psalm 8 and also Psalm 144, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah said when he saw the Lord in his magnificence, exalted, lifted up, he said of him that day, he said, I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of an unclean people. And that was Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. Isaiah also said, you are our father and we are but clay. 
New Testament scriptures. In John chapter 3 and verse 30, John the Baptist said when he had completed his ministry introducing Jesus, he said, I must decrease so he can increase. What a great attitude to have. Who cares what happens? I mean, so your ministry isn't known. So you think I'm trying to get my ministry known out there. You serve Jesus and you'll get known. Believe me, quit trying to do it yourself and let the Lord do it. Let him exalt you. Let him lift you up. If you'll humble yourself, He's the one that will exalt you. And remember that again from the word of God. And so again, I must decrease so that he could increase. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse seven says, again, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And so your body has not been redeemed yet. It still came from the dust of the ground, still carries a curse in it. And you have to walk uh, in power over that curse so that if you live by the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10 says, when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul realized that the more I realize in myself I'm inadequate and everything I do is accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the word and the walk of faith, then these things are accomplished in my life. So again, we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And so again, exalting yourself. It's all coming down to this. And what I'm saying is, yes, people are going to magnify you, put you up, but keep a humble attitude about yourself. Listen, take your ministry seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. Take God seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. The moment you start to take yourself seriously, believe me, you're headed for a downfall. God, in essence, the more you think about yourself, the more God takes his hands off, folds them, and watches you fail. But the more you humble yourself, he will cause you to be exalted, lifted up, and even higher. In fact, Paul said of the thorn in the flesh, it was given to me lest I should be exalted above measure and point out it came from the devil. And God doesn't care if you're exalted above measure if you keep a humble attitude, but Satan attacked him so he wouldn't become exalted above measure. In other words, there is no limit to how high God will exalt you if you'll keep your attitude right. And we've seen examples of that in, in the church history of tremendous ministers who walked with humbleness of heart. And I love having ministry friends who have humbleness of heart. They are no different in the pulpit than they are outside the pulpit, no different outside the pulpit than they are in the pulpit. They talk the same. Again, I said I worked with Kenneth Hagin and I was just always amazed at his humbleness. We, he sat down to the lunch table with us one day. I mean, he had a, a sack in his hand with a half a sandwich in it and an apple. That's what he brought to work that day. And he started sharing with us around the table stories and it was the same stories he told in the pulpit. I thought, I've heard this four times. And yet it, he was no different at the table than he was behind the pulpit. And somebody said something about uh, the body of Christ. And Brother Hagin waxed real, waxed real eloquent that day. He had that apple in his hand. I remember he looked up and he said, you know, if every member of the body of Christ would find out where they're supposed to function and then be happy and content there, there's no force on this earth that could stop the body of Christ. And I thought, wow, he's talking about humbleness. He's talking about just accept your position. Quit trying to be somebody else. Quit trying to impress somebody else. All you're out to do is just say, hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. He said, in essence, what Brother Hagin was saying was, that's when God can truly use you, when we quit thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. So, uh, Again, don't do that. The next question comes to this. Uh, is praying in tongues the perfect prayer? I've heard this said before. Well, praying in tongues is the perfect prayer. Is that true? It is if that's what's needed. I don't, I'm, I'm saying, I will get to it. There is a perfect prayer that is true, but whatever is needed at the moment is your perfect prayer at that time. I mean, if God's done something great for you, you don't need to fall into heavy intercession. A prayer of thanksgiving would be real nice and a prayer of praise would be nice. There's all different types of prayer. If a friend comes to you and he's got a deed and says, well, you stand with me in prayer. Well, they're the only prayer you want to pray for is intercessory. You want to join them together and see that need. And so you want to come together, unite together, and you want to pray for them. And if pre people are, you hear about a need somewhere across the country. I mean, we often hear that, uh, that something's happening in government and we need some more Christians to stand up. That's an intercessory prayer. You need to pray for God to raise up someone or someone to catch the vision and go with it. So there's all different types of prayer and there's a time to pray in the spirit. But honestly, no. Speaking with tongues is not the perfect prayer. Praying the word is the perfect prayer. And until you can get to that point, you have to pray other prayers to finally get the mind of Christ. And once you get the mind of Christ, then you can pray the will of God. When you pray the will of God, of course, you pray the word of God. The most powerful prayers that Paul prayed, we quote them quite often in Ephesians, is praying the word of God. I pray the eyes of your understanding being lightened. That's scripture. He prayed scriptural principles over them. 
And that is the most powerful prayer you can pray. You know what that is? That's mixing the power of the Holy Spirit with the power of the Word of God. And those two are eternal. Put those two together and you have a powerful combination. Romans chapter 8 tells us, it says in verse 26 and verse 27, likewise the Spirit also helps our infirmities. The Greek word, although it's the same word for sickness, is not here referring to sickness. It's referring to weaknesses. In the natural, we have weaknesses. We do not always know what to pray for. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought or as we should. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. This verse simply says, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how long you've been born again. I don't care if you've known Jesus all your life, and I don't care if you've memorized the Bible from front to back. Guess what? Life is still filled with surprises. Things come your way that you had no concept of. Things are going to happen. You go, where did this come from? Believe me, I've been born again for years and I'm still taken by surprise once in a while. And I don't like it. In fact, one time I, we had a great service on Sunday. Monday morning, I walked into my office and found out there had been a kind of a coup in the church and somebody was trying to take over some area of the church, trying to cause a division. You think I was happy? Of course I was not happy. But the next thing I thought is, Lord, why didn't I know this? You said you'd show me things to come and here I miss this thing. Oh, come on, God, I should have known this. I've been praying, I've been walking with you. Here I was bragging on myself. And I said, you said you'd show me things to come. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I said, I'd show you things to come. I didn't say I'd show you everything to come. Man, that rocked me back. He said, if I showed you everything to come, where would the walk of faith be? And he said, you might be taken by surprise, but I'm never taken by surprise. And suddenly I just mellowed out. I'm here to tell you, this says right in this verse of scripture, he helps our infirmities. What we know not for what to praise we ought. All of a sudden you think, you think you're smart. Something usually happens to you to show you how dumb you really are. And once you find out what that, that this problem is solved, you realize, man, I don't know as much as I thought I did. And you suddenly find yourself in a position, how do I pray for this? I don't know who started this. I don't know to what extent it has gone. It looks like this thing's been working for months and I'm just now finding out about it and all this stuff's behind the scenes of tr Satan trying to overthrow this thing. You know what to do? Pray in tongues. That's the only thing you can do. You know why you pray in tongues? You don't pray in tongues because you think that prayer is doing something effectual and gonna change the situation. That doesn't change the situation. Praying in tongues changes you. Well, what a blessing this entire week has been, and I hope we have really made you hungry and really made you thirsty for getting this particular series, so it'll be a great blessing in your life. If you already ordered it, thank you. If you've been sitting all week waiting to order it, what is wrong with you? You need this series in your life. It'll greatly change you and greatly change your ministry on how to approach people with the new birth and how to approach people also with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So again, the questions we answered today, I trust they really blessed you, but get your copy, the book that you can mark up and, and underline and, and look at it later and see the revelations God gave to you, but also the flash drive, the CD, flash, uh, the DVD series also. It was a, such a tremendous blessing. I know that's going to be a great blessing to you. I've enjoyed teaching this week. Or again, only we've given you excerpts. All the rest of it is contained in this particular series. So again, thank you so much for joining us this week. And may the Lord just enrich everything you have heard this week and make it even more real to your life. See you next week. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.